Hello everyone, this is the Outliers Writing University YouTube channel with your host, Kathleen Antrim and D.P. Lyle. This is Get to Know. And I'm Kathleen Antrim, and today we are here with John Land. John is a New York Times bestselling author of over 50 books, and we cannot wait to get to know him. Welcome, John. You know what? Does this mean I'm like, I've never been associated with actually teaching at a university, even though I'm close to Brown, and I've never been a disruptor. So this is exciting for me. <laughs> John, you were born a disruptor. <laughs> you were born a disruptor. When you were in grammar yes. school, how many times did you go to the principal's office? Uh, you know what? No one knew my name in elementary school. I'm making lost time today. That's why. I <laughs> oh my gosh. So when you were growing up, I want to know, were you like a cool kid or were you kind of a dorky kid or shy, outgoing? What kind of a kid were you? You know what? Um, you go all the way back. It's a great question. No one's ever asked me that before. And <laughs> is, I want to get to know you. You can, you, you can trace all my eccentricities, the wildness of my imagination, my role playing, you know, because that's what writers are. We're role players. You know, we, 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 we imagine things in our head um, or we bring reality to life through our imagination in nonfiction. It all goes back to my James Bond stage, to my vampire stage, to... Um, to the fact that I was always a kid who could entertain himself. All I, I could always have fun alone. Um, I could always, you know, and, and a lot of times I actually, and, and still uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, prefer that and to, to, you know, prefer that. I think that I was learning very young in life, very early in life. We are what we, you know, maybe this was all meant to be that, uh, what what that I preferred living in a box and that my greatest uh, that I loved living in a box where I, my, my imagination could conjure up the world around me. And I so think does this mean you didn't have play dates. You didn't have any play dates. <laughs> and, and, and when you say box, are you referring to the closet oh, or a Skinner <laughs> box? Maybe uh, uh, it was it, the box got bigger as, as time. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and it's still and it's still growing. Uh, because I, you know, I, I I have much more of a sense of community these days. But at heart, I'm I'm still the person who likes to live in their mind, yeah. and I think that's that is why, even though I had spent all my youth with dreams of becoming a lawyer and going to law school, I ultimately went with the currents and I went with who I was um, a, as a young boy which was the eccentric, crazy. I found an outlet for my madness. Um, <laughs> Stephen King often says, has said several times, especially years ago, that if he wasn't a writer, he'd be in mental a mental hospital. Or, <laughs> and I, I don't know which of those I would be in, but you know, um, writing is events. Writing, it is a great gift to be able to make a living doing the thing that is most natural, that is who you, that describes not just what you do, but who you are. You know, I always tell people that it, it, writing sounds like a glamorous uh, profession, but really it's a very lonely profession. You spend so much time by yourself, but don't you think that's like you were saying, or don't you think that's necessary to be a good writer? You have to be comfortable in a room by yourself playing with your imaginary friends. You know something, Doug? I think it's, um, I actually think it's more than preference. It's more, it's more necessity. Right. You, you do it because you have, because it's, it's, it's what you're, it's what drives you. And there's nothing I, I, I enjoy more than, than getting into that space where time kind of stops and, um, I'm in that world. I'm in the world of my own creation. The um, zone, so to speak. You know what? Here's the amazing thing. And, and I'm, ne I'm, I'm, the, I'm the most miserable when I'm not writing. And I'm the most content when I am. Why? Writing is therapy. No matter how 
whatever is going on in my life, um, and, and we all face downturns financially, um, socially, you know, in all kinds of different ways. Um, but when when I'm writing, I can write no matter what is going on in the external world, because writing internalizes everything. So for me, it isn't just it's not just a way to make a living. It's it's a way of life. You know, I, that's so interesting. And I want to know at what point and how old were you when you realized you really were a writer at heart? When did you write your first book? I wrote my, and it, 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 well, the two questions you just asked me are that have the same answer. I wrote my first book as a senior thesis at Brown University because it was there that I fell in love with two things. And these things are interconnected. I fell in love with the process of writing of putting paid of just the stringing sentences together, even in term papers and coming up with that line that would just resonate. I fell in love with writing, but I also perhaps more importantly, fell in love with seeing my name in print. <laughs> my first published article actually appeared, was actually in people magazine, which was, which then had a circulation of like 9 million copies. This would have been 1978 in the winter. I think it was January. And I couldn't wait that I opened up that People magazine. Um, the cover was green. I still have copies. I should have pulled them out today. I don't remember who was on the cover, but I went to my article, two pages, and nothing I had written was still there. They had rewritten <laughs> two, three thousand words into their five. That's what People magazine, that's what they do. Exactly. Yeah. You know? words in capital letters at the very end that were still there that were mine were j-o-n space l-a-n-d <laughs> no that's a good lesson for our audience by the way <laughs> nothing that the author wrote was actually still in the article oh except my name yes i will say that was the most my first published article ever was the most i was ever edited of course there were there some people would say that that's a problem with some of my books that they should have been edited a lot more. <laughs> um, but but for the for for that for those purposes, um, and that People magazine article led to me taking on assignments for the Saturday Evening Post, where I where I actually they really liked an article I had sent them, but they killed it at the last minute because it was a little controversial. But they said, "What else would you like to do for us? Because we like your writing." And I said, "Well, I'd love to do celebrity interviews." And they said, would you like to, literally, uh, would you like to interview Robert Wagner and Natalie Wood? Would you like to interview Gene <laughs> Kelly? Would you like to do is, so it's all these stories they had backlogged because they wow. had who had corresponded, the famous Pete Martin, who had done some of the greatest celebrity profiles for the Post in his heyday of all time. Now, they did say, we can't pay your travel expenses, but um, we'll pay you enough for the articles that you'll, you, you'll more than break even. I was investing in myself. Let me tell you something. I would have. I would have done it for free. And those sure. that experience at, at the age of 20, I was fly, I flew out to California, interviewed I one of the, it became one of the last full profiles of Natalie Wood. She died only three or four years later on wow. the boat. And Gene Kelly, um, and, and this is an important question that you've asked me because it's my career has come full circle. I'm now back to doing that only in narrative nonfiction and ghostwriting. But so interesting. Gene Kelly was 72 when I interviewed him. He was on this, I, you know, part of it was on the set of Xanadu, um, a movie he was doing with Michael Beck and Olivia Newton-John, um, directed by- I Robert. remember that movie. Oh my gosh, yeah. Gene Kelly had been interviewed thousands of times. And Dale Olson drove, picked me up at the Beverly Hilton and drove me over to his house and warned me that you're only going to get 25 or 30 minutes with him. You're going to get all the signs. When I stand up, it's time to leave. Um, don't worry, don't, don't be hurt, get what you need in 30 minutes and, and then we'll leave. Well, I got there and I noticed, and, and, um, I've learned in the process of interviewing, you don't talk about, you talk, you have a conversation. It's not an interview. And to make a long story short, um, an hour and 45 minutes after we sat down, um, it was time to leave. Wow. And Dale Olson. Uh, with Rogers and Cowan, um, I can't believe I'm remembering his name. Um, we got in his Mercedes convertible, and he hadn't said a word. He was, and I said, "Dale, did I do something wrong? 
what, what's wrong? What, what, what is it? And he goes, I've been his publicist for 28 years. That's the best interview Gene Kelly has ever given. Mm. Wow, that's fantastic. Such an, uh, you know, you learn confidence, you build confidence. Um, now, I will say that another article that I, <laughs> an article, another article that I had to do for the Saturday Evening Post, I did some short stories for them a few years ago, and it was so great. It was like coming home again, um, was on Young Hollywood. And I was interviewing all these young heartthrobs. And I, a few of them became good friends, like for a while, like Parker Stevenson, because he had gone, he was one of the Hardy Boys and he had gone to Princeton and I was at Brown. So we we had this thing. So rivalry. <laughs> we, we clashed a little bit. Uh, Clark Brandon from um, the, the show called The Fitzpatrick's. Uh, I was supposed to do Christy and Jimmy McNichol uh, for a cover story. And I was out in LA and I got a call from their mother, who was also their manager. and. He said, we have a problem. I said, what's wrong? They actually paged me at the pool. I mean, it was great. You know, yeah. <laughs> cell phones or beepers even in those days, or they probably had beepers. So it's so not Hollywood. Yes. I'm, I'm getting paged at the pool at the Beverly Hilton. And Christy McNichols, no, the mother is saying that Christy's locked in the room. We can't do the interview. Uh, <laughs> so it never happened. And of course, the Post didn't want a Jimmy McNichols story because he was just, he was basically known as, Christy McNichols' um, brother, who, who I had gotten to know through doing the article on Clark Brandon, because they were both in the, the show called The Fitzpatricks, which I think ran all of half a season. Um, so <laughs> not all. I mean, I interviewed <laughs> for, for a difference. might have been the same story. This teen idol named Leif Garrett later had some tragedy. Uh, Leif yeah. yes. You know, uh, I, I don't want to disparage him, um, but I will. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, inside was, scoop here, people. I mean, he was really here. Here. <laughs> you know, given the fact that he was really pretty, but there there wasn't a lot to ask him. Um, and and he was 15 or 16, and he reeked of weed. Now I'm not gonna put <laughs> I love weed. Uh, but 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 you know what? Don't show up to an interview so stoned you can't even talk. You know, <laughs> oh my the God. Interview I ever did in my life. So since I gave you the best interview Gene Kelly had ever done, I had to give you, I had to give you the worst. <laughs> the three line interview with Keith Garrett. <laughs> well, you, you've done a lot, John. I mean, you've written movies, you know, you did the murder. She wrote series. You had the Catlin strong series, which still is one of my favorite all time. I just loved her. I love that whole series. You've, you've done, a, you've written with Heather, you know, uh, Heather Graham, the, the sci-fi things and all this, but, uh, I want to ask you about this, this here. Tell me about that. You know what? There, there's the that's probably the biggest book I've ever done. It's coming out from Harper um, in August of 2023. Um, it's the first ghostwriting project, which is a strange way of putting it, since you'll notice my name is on the cover. Um, the, it's the first ghostwriting project I I've taken on that's actually going to be published. Others will be have, will have finished, but this one is the first because they're rushing it out in time. Um, for to get out there before the election and it's a big book for harper collins and it's the most important and the biggest book i've ever done because not only is it an incredible narrative nonfiction, novelistic story of a, of a army sniper who infiltrated the ku klux klan not once but twice the first time he prevented the assassination of then candidate barack obama the second time he he virtually brought the entire organization down. Um, but along the way, he was struck by the number of current and former law enforcement and military that were joining not only the Klan, but it's then yeah. off, which were malicious. Even then, hmm. there was a tremendous overlap between Klan members, militia members, biker gangs, they, they traveled in the same circles and they, and again, their rosters often mirrored each other. So he got the whole notion that the theory, the, the thesis of the book is that the original mandate of the Ku Klux Klan from 1865, if you read what they were really wanted to do when they pronounced themselves the invisible empire, the thesis of the book is that's what we might be facing 
depending on how the election of 2024 goes. Wow. Is wow, a, that is something else. Living in a one of the most precarious times of our history. And even though this is narrative nonfiction, it is a cautionary tale written by someone who, uh, told by someone, Joe, Joe Moore, um, the man who lived this. Um, for 10 years, he was inside the Ku Klux Klan in a way that no one ever, uh, and two different clavers, in, both in Florida. Um, it was a scary book to write. And I think it's going to be a scary book to read. Um, it's interesting, Dr. Doug and, and Kathy, as a fiction author, you struggle for two things. Well, you struggle for, for relevance. Uh, you need to be relevant in the marketplace mm -hmm. to succeed. But you don't care about societal or, 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 or sociological resonance. Your books don't need to resonate as, resonate as anything but great stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was an incredible experience for me, and it's ongoing because we're still in the end. We just finished the legal review, which was like take, which was like taking out your own kidney. Um, and, <laughs> but, With a butter knife. <laughs> it was the legal review was performed by a terrific staff at Harper that that lost sleep over trying to help us keep the most important parts that are so salacious. But the point I want to get to is. This is the first book that I feel is not only relevant, but resonant. It's an important book. It's the kind of book that not only screams New York Times bestseller, but screams to be the kind of book um, that people will read, that will become a historical document for this era. Mm -hmm. um, like okay. I said, it's, it's, it's a scary book. If, if you... Uh, if you you know you're reading this book is 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 an education on the mentality of the kind of people uh, that 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 were at the Capitol on January sixth, um, and how we're, and and the state of our country, or what I, what the state of our country might be. I have a question for you, John. So um, obviously, the book takes place pretty much in current time, and when you're looking at um, where there's overlap between law enforcement and the KKK, are those in certain states? Is that across the country? Um, you know, where does this predominantly take place? Well, it's nationwide. Um, okay. You see, the KKK is not the KKK is not just a group, Kathy. It's an ideology, right. and the ideology is present from coast to coast. Obviously, it's much deeper in Florida, Mississippi. Um, California, believe it or not, Michigan, hmm. uh, the, you know, the Michigan militia is, is but the, the scary thing, and it's a great question, it isn't, you can wipe out individuals, but the ideology of the Klan and its notion of an existence as the invisible empire, the thing we get to in the book is that this is not the first time we face this kind of crisis. We hmm. faced 1939 with Father Coughlin just prior to World War II, when a huge percentage of the country did was, was in support of Hitler, um, you know, preferred Hitler and didn't want us to get involved in, in World War II. They, they foresaw saw a world of Germany and the United States as allies. Um, we faced it again in the 1920s when 50,000 or more Klansmen marched on Washington in full regalia. And, and, you know, we were going to have pictures in the book of, of that march. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, we faced it a, a, yet again in 19, in the 50s with McCarthy, um, mm -hmm. where, where reactionary and, uh, and, and, and emotion um, kind of, you know, where, where we saw the damage one person could do, one ideologue one autocrat or, you know, that everyone was afraid to take on, including Eisenhower. Um, so what we're facing today, I mean, you go all the way back to the 1860s and, and then post reconstruction too, but this is something John Meacham and far, the great historian and far people far smarter than I have talked about. And I really believe that, that white robes and broken badges um, can become that kind of seminal treatise um, that chronicles where America is at this place and time. 
So that's did that's you, it was and it's all book. potentially see a follow up to this book. Um I I think there's that's up that's really up to Joe Moore. I mean, we were talking about what the follow up could be, but here's the thing. We don't know what the sequel is because we don't know what the world right. is going to be like in November, you know, post election 2024. Um, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of movies like political thrillers like The Manchurian Candidate, mm -hmm. especially Seven Days in May, uh, the greatest ever made, both directed by John Frankenheimer, interestingly enough. Uh, the two great two of the greatest political thrillers more modern ones like three days of the condor um i don't know how far away we are from something like seven days in may you know we're, we're, you know basic and so the sequel to white robes and broken badges can't be written until we know what the shape of the country looks like sure. after yes it would obviously have to be a few years down the road or more than a few years so that we would actually have the benefit of that of that history and being able to look back more objectively on it. You know what? Um, if if this book does as well, I mean, uh, unlike fiction, which everything is a series, nonfiction, um, all, you there, it only becomes there are only sequels if they are called for. I don't think any. I don't think it's possible to write a great nonfiction book anticipating a sequel sure yeah, it's real life right it's, right even That's though the, the secret to telling great narrative nonfiction is to make it feel like it's real in the same respect that one of the secrets of writing great fiction is making uh, is making it seem you're trying to make nonfiction feel like fiction and mm -hmm. when you're writing fiction, you're trying to make it feel real. So right. it's it's a weird dichotomy. Um uh and it's uh it's a lot hard. I think nonfiction is, is harder in most ways. It's a lot easier to just make crap up uh, <laughs> and do whatever you want. Um, but it's it's a much heavier responsibility, a much bigger burden to do a book like White Robes and Broken Badges. Sure. Now, when is the release date on this book? August 13th, 2024. Oh, wow. Oh. So just months ahead of the election. Cool. That's timely. That's the point. Thanks to the great staff at Harper. Do that you think it, it might be uh, kind of an early October surprise, as they say, during the election cycle? I hope so. I hope so. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of center, center left. I voted for Reagan twice. I voted, I, I, thought George H.W. was, was, you know, uh, I, I, I thought he was just a terrific guy, Griffin, you know, it, a very, mm -hmm. uh, one of the, one of the best politicians that I, in my lifetime, but, you know, I'm not that kind of person, you know, they're, they're those kind of candidates couldn't, aren't around anymore, at least representing their party. So I've become, um, I'm scared. Um, and I think, my own fear is reflected in the writing uh, of Joe Moore's story. So it's going to be, it's, it's, it's been a great experience to write it. It's been a great experience to work with Harper on it. Um, you know, I never, the great thing about nonfiction is you get to work with doing ghostwriting. You right. get with different publishers and different editors. And, you know, you always, you always want to think that, the publisher you're with is you're always going to be there and um they're the only ones who know what they're doing they're the only ones who get you <laughs> somewhere else with a book like this and it's oh they get me too there's so <laughs> you know there are and you know yeah. what this publishing company has edit has an, has editors also <laughs> we make my work <laughs> and, and do the line of the thing and, you know. well let's look at a, let's look at another area of your incredible career and tell us about this. Uh, no, no, that yeah, not that one. Yeah, AJ. Yeah, Lamb, this one, which is unique. Yeah, I'm I'm a ghostwriter, and on the, my ghost written nonfiction, my name appears on the books. And here's my next thriller written with my good friend Jeff Ayers. Um, and <laughs> it's not my name. Um, but if you go on, <laughs> it, it says it is. So so Jeff and I chose the name AJ Landau. Kind of blends our names together. <laughs> and um somehow 
Um, and this is a story that actually does have a nonfiction backdrop, which is the national parks. Um, Jeff Ayers, who's a, a, a really good writer, um, but also is a tremendous editor and 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 conceptual guy, which is which is how we worked, why we work so well together. He is an expert in the national parks. He's been to almost all. He's been to them. He under he can you know he can he knows the history of them. So we decided, I should say, he decided and then brought me into it to do a series of thrillers with a backdrop of the national parks. The last few years, the national parks they were always popular. Over three hundred million visits to the national parks each. Wow. Year. Yeah. That's 10 times the people who visited Disney, both Disney's on, on either coast, 10 times national parks. So there is definitely an interest in the national parks, a reverence for national parks. But of course, Dr. Doug and Kathy, you know me. How do we open this book? The Statue of Liberty gets blown up. It's <laughs> 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 about this. You need to think bigger, John. <laughs> Fact, and this is something I really hadn't thought of before. Leave No Trace is the fictional realization, is the fictional version of white robes and broken badges. Because okay. it's, and Je it's me and Jeff, Jeff and I, excising our demons about what might be in the offing. When you read the book, it's not hard to figure out who some of the characters are because they're modeled after real life. a couple of them are modeled after real life people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's taking it's kind of if we are not careful what ha and what what this what the conspiracy is about what this um what the movement that is trying to basically take over the the government is at, what they're doing is they're destroying national symbols. They're destroying, you know, they're, they're trying to knock out the Statue of Liberty. They're, they target Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the Gateway Arch in, in St. Louis. Um, it, we have seen set in in, uh, in Mount Rainier National Park. We go to Zion. Um, how do you attack one of the biggest sprawling? Zion is the size of Rhode Island. <laughs> attack a national park. Well, when you when Leave No Trace comes out, you'll see. So their notion is if you would, if you're going to break down the country, you break down the iconic symbols that define it because you're going to rebuild it from scratch. So it is an attack at the heart and soul of America, wow. um, national parks. So it's pretty visceral. See, I, I think as I as I've gotten more experienced, I've always been really visual, but I think what I'm what I've tried to do. Um, as I progressed as a writer is become more visceral, more hit you in the gut with something that matters. My last Caitlin Strong book, which Dr. Doug mentioned that series earlier, was about the opioid crisis and about not only um, Caitlin realizing she has an opioid problem for, because of a, a, she, she was in a traumatic, um, an explosion caused a traumatic brain injury. So she's on Vicodin. One of her surrogate sons ODs and almost dies. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so I, that's visceral. It's not just visual. It's visual. And I think the, the greatest thriller writers, just like the greatest writers, period. Um, many of the greatest thriller writers are also, to me, America's best novelists. You know, that mm -hmm. we've talked about James Lee Burke. We've talked about David Morrell. We've talked about Lee Child, that their books are mirrors for the way society is functioning at a certain time. Um, and just because they're entertainment doesn't mean they're not important. Right. Uh, well, the, the, the concept you, you laid out about destroying the national symbols and all that to kind of disrupt society. I remember, and Kathy may remember this too, Bryce Courtney, you know, who wrote the power mm -hmm. of one and was the best selling author in the history of Australia. And all that. And Bryce is a, is a storyteller and he's an interesting guy. Well, he grew up in South Africa. And he said, the power one is almost an autobiography of him, so to speak. But uh, he said that when the Zulu nation was rising throughout Southern Africa, that they didn't just conquer the other tribes, they absorbed them. And what they did is they not only killed the power structure, they killed the storyteller. 
because they didn't want those individual tribes to have a history so they would become not conquered by the Zulu, but they would become Zulu. Wow. Wow is wow is right. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if we if we looked at conquerors throughout history, um they always rewrite history. Um, you know, it's um I I I get a kick out of one of the great lines ever in thriller, the, the world of thrillers, was Sean Connery as James Bond in Dr. No, lighting a cigarette and looking at Dr. No and going, World domination, same old plan. <laughs> How long? That was 1960, right? It was the first. Yeah, right. How long has world domination been the central goal of, of, of great thrillers? And, and, you know, when I think about my career, um, you know, I talk about the role playing and everything, but the, the first thing I come back to is I think that the first movie I ever saw was um, 101 Dalmatians. And uh, I, yeah, I've ever every story I've ever told is 101 Dalmatians. Has there ever been a worse villain than a better villain in that respect? I don't Kruger? think so. Yeah, no, she's fabulous. Uh, Absolutely fabulous. Who's gonna kill a hundred puppies to make a goat? How much worse does it get? Does it get than that? But then the other <laughs> thing is from the age of seven, eight, nine years old, I was obsessed with Bond movies. The only Bond is J is Sean Connery. Let's face it. And those Amen. Five, no Roger Moore, huh? No, Sean. And they were some of them were really good, but mm -hmm. Sean is the only James Bond. And <laughs> oh, Doug, you, you know our our good friend Ray Benson loved Timothy Dalton. Go figure. This Go is figure. The exactly. Bond experts in the world. He's written some of the novels, and he and he loved a guy who I thought was was unwatchable as Bond. But <laughs> he was not my favorite. Those, yeah. those movies, I I think, were more influential to me as a writer because I still am doing the same thing. I'm still in fiction writing the big job, writing the big, the 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 the, the, the villain who, who is looking at something great, not a villain. It's it's world domination, same old plan. And and the challenge of doing eleven Caitlin Strong Texas Ranger books was how do I do it eleven times out of Texas, one state? <laughs> It's going to be, of course, I, I should have moved it to Florida, just like Carl Hyacinth says talk, when he talks about what, you know, the zany stuff that happens down there. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you have 11 world domination plots or, <laughs> you know, country, and sometimes it's an accident. Sometimes something gets loose. I mean, the Andromeda strain is another huge influence on me. Um, you know, I think you can make great stories are timeless. You could make the Andromeda strain today, and except for the computers that had the old teletype, you know, the green and white paper, right? So, right, besides that, the Andromeda strain holds up in every way today, and I think that's true. Of, of you know, watch Seven Days in May, um, the boys from Brazil. I mean, you know, great stories, groundbreaking stories, you know the first of, of, of what they did, Rosemary's baby. You could make that movie today. The exercise. Right. right. Um, well, let me know. ask you, <clears throat> excuse me. It sounds like you are really influenced by movies. Yes. Um, what books are there? Any books that have influenced you in this way? Oh, 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 of course. And, and I go back to, well, I mentioned the exorcist. That was the first book I read beginning to end in a single sitting. Literally. Oh, like, wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I grew up reading um, Irving Wallace, um, you know, her, you know, which was, you know, he was a thriller writer, you know, um, but I, you learn pacing. I mean, what made me want to be a thriller writer, uh, um, when I think back, there were four authors I read who, whose work, you know, Victor Hugo said, once said, good writers borrow, great writers steal. <laughs> I the most of them when I started out. In no particular order, Robert Ludlum, the modern Raisy Circle and the whole Croft Covenant. <laughs> yes. Stephen King, The Shining, Firestarter, Dead Zone. Um, the early yes. Stephen King books and the great, why I call him my favorite author is because all these years later, yeah, he's had some bad periods and some bad books, but 
He's still at it, and he's still a great writer and a great storyteller. Clive Cussler, um, before he became Seven People. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we can talk about that another day. Um, Clive's, early, you know, Raise the Titanic and Vixen 03, Sahara. Um, I mean, so many great books. And I, and I mentioned it before, The Professor, David Morrell, Brotherhood of the Rose, Fraternity of the Stone. I'm not even getting to Rambo. Um, um, just groundbreaking thriller writers who are also who are incredible storytellers and i started my career by trying to imitate those four authors some of my books some of the passages of my books if i can tell you you can see exactly where i stole it. you know <laughs> where i stole it i mean i did a book called vortex it's basically firestar basically oh. with a boy instead of a girl you know, on his own, not not having anyone to help him. I mean, um, you know, and then you, you can't help. I mean, I grew up on shows like The Twilight Zone, mm -hmm. um, the original Outer Limits. And I tell young writers, I'm talking junior high and high school age. I say, you know, who want to start off by writing short stories. And, and, and don't think ill of me for this, because I do recommend them. I do tell them to read, you know. Stephen King's Night Shift. I tell them to read O. Henry's collections. I, I give them, the, you know, tell them to read the Ernest Hemingway short stories. But I always direct them to the old Twilight Zone, uh -huh. and the, especially the old Twilight Zone. And Alfred, because those 24, 23, 25 minute right. were beginning, middle, and end. They told a story. They always had the great twist or some twist at the end. Um, yeah, I'll recommend Rappuccini's Daughter uh, by Hawthorne, because to me, it's arguably the greatest short story ever written. Um, but I want them to read the watch The Invaders to serve man. Um, you know, uh, if you want to go to Night Gallery, they're tearing down Tim Riley's bar, which, and these were all, by the way, written by Rod Searle. Uh, right. Sometimes the guys of other names. Uh, but they were all Rod Serling stories. Rod Serling wrote the screenplay for Planet of the Apes, uh, Seven Days I in Bed. I did not know that. Requiem for Heavyweight was, was his story patterns. And many, many movies he was he rewrote without being credited. Uh, but he was a great underrated writer. Or people thinking of him as the, in, just the person who introduced the Twilight Zone. Well, he wrote the Twilight Zones. And the best night galleries were all Rod Serling. Oh, wow. <laughs> Tearing down Tim Riley's bar. He wrote Eyes with Joan Crawford, um, Man in a Boat with Richard Kiley. You know, I can go on forever. But here's the point. Whether it's TV, movies, or books, great writing and great story. Great storytelling is great storytelling. It doesn't right. matter what medium you're telling the story. Mm -hmm. You, you want to write something. I mean... What is the my definition of a great movie is a film you can watch a hundred times and enjoy as much the hundredth time. I just watched two movies for the 99th time. I won't go a hundred. The Usual Suspects and Field of Dreams. Those uh, are perfect. Yes. Movies. They are perfect. And yeah, sure. The Godfather is a perfect movie. And there are, there are a lot of films that I would call perfect. But watching The Usual Suspects and and... Field of Dreams might be one of the top 10 films ever made. That's how good that movie is. Um, and you, you every time you watch it, when you watch a movie a lot, and I'm saying you it, it, rhetorically, you are a different person than the last time you saw. And what, you're, yeah. you, bring to the, what you bring to viewing this, and this is true of books too. Um, there are a number of books I've read multiple times, like Marathon Man by William Goldman also a great movie, but an even better book. Every time I read that book, I'm a different person than I was the last time. So I see things in it I didn't see the, the, the first, the, you know, I, I learn more. I, I, I visualize more. I find more I can steal. Um, <laughs> it, so it, 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 it's, it's the, I think if, if I had to define myself as a writer, I often say I, I, I prefer to call myself a storyteller. But um, if you can tell a great story, you can be a great writer. If you can't tell a great story, you can't be a great writer. 
Wow. Um, you know, John, we could go on and talk for an hour more Easily. as we usually do when we get together on and yes. on and on, but, uh, we got usually have a cocktail. Yeah. We, we got to wrap this up, but I'm going to tell you, this has been wonderful and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I have to point out that John is part of the outliers team and he's going to be teaching in our, uh, year long, actually ongoing forever and ever, uh, uh, university to teach people how to write. Uh, John's taught a lot. He taught in craft fest for many years. He sat on the board of ITW, helped build ITW. He was there at ground zero at Bowser Khan in Chicago. So he's yes. been around all of that and, and has been a long time friend and a great writer and, and a great storyteller. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Doug. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much, John. <laughs> so know, right before we go, name your book and the release date again. Uh, Leave No Trace, February 27th from Minotaur. Okay. And White Robes and Broken Badges, August 13th. Fantastic. Um, Cannot wait to read them. I can't wait to hear, to hear, see people reading them. <laughs> That's right. You sure will, I'm sure. Well. All right. So on that note. We're going to wrap up this episode of the YouTube channel of Outliers Writing University. We thank you all for watching and go to John's website. It'll be posted at, right after this video and buy his books. You will not be disappointed. Mm -hmm. Boy, that was fun. Yeah, that was fun. It was so much fun. So send me the link. It's a get to know. See, we want to do it a little differently. When it's posted, let me know, and I'll, I'll post it. I'll put it up on Instagram, and I'll can. Do I have that outliers thing? That 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 the logo. Thing? We can get that over to you. So you have the logo. I'll send it to you. Because I want to post that on Instagram and Facebook. Oh, you right. got it. You got I it. I can send you the link for the current funnel because we've 